Hello, everybody. Welcome to this edition of Coffee Time with Byron. I'm your host, Byron. Alongside me, former MLB player, long time man, long time analyst for the now Miami Marlins, was Florida Marlins. Now, uh, what would you say, pre and pregame host now for the for them, uh, Tommy Hutton. How are you tonight? And you actually now have a what this show should be called because now you're drinking a beer. So now I now I need. <laughs> so. Oh, you busted me. <laughs> yeah, what are you drinking over there? Yeah, you busted me. Well, we you know it's that time of night. It's even past happy hour, but uh, yeah, this is about the last uh, three or four years I've been involved uh, with uh, what was Fox Sports Net, now Bally Sports in doing uh, uh, about 50 pre- and post-game shows uh, with the Marlins. So after, uh, after 19 years in the booth uh, as an analyst, uh, I, I kind of had a couple of years where I didn't work, and then I'm uh, just involved. I, I enjoy it because it still keeps me involved in the game, and I, lo- I love the game. Yeah, so I, now that you brought that up, I got I to gotta ask you, I want to ask first and foremost, now I know this is totally a different sport, but – Along grace, I know you guys are owned, obviously, by Derek Jeter. The I want to say one of the all-time greats in Major League Baseball, depending on who you ask. Now, since you're close with the team, do you think he's that? Do you think he can actually turn around the Marlins from where they actually were? Unlike what Elway has been able to do with the Broncos and Michael Jordan with the Hornets they're still struggling and those two are considered their greats in their game but they have yet to progress to championships now that they're owners do you see Derek Jeter turning the ship around for the Marlins you know and those are good examples I I really never thought of uh, Elway and Jordan in in those other uh, cases uh, which are different different sports Mm -hmm. uh, to to try to turn around teams all I know is having followed uh, Derek Jeter over the years uh, when he was a player and, and knowing the type of player he was, I mean, he was the type of player. He would, he would say that the season was a failure if the Yankees didn't win the World Series. Uh, right. He didn't want to get to the playoffs. He didn't want to finish with a winning record. It was a failure if they didn't win the World Series. Right. So someone with that determination and the goals that he has – I'm telling you, he could do many, many other things uh, as as opposed to owning a baseball team. And he could make a ton of money, whatever venture he decided to do. Well, he decided to be a part ownership uh, with uh, Bruce Sherman. And just knowing the way he approached his career, he doesn't want to do this and lose. So he knows there's a process. He knows it takes a while. And right now in in South Florida and Miami, everybody's waiting for that process because last year, uh, after making the playoffs in a shortened season the year before, last year wasn't a good year. And uh, I think they realize that, and they know they have to make some some moves, either via trades or free agents. So I'm really anticipating the offseason this year to see what they do. Now, I I recently had on – a while back ago on my old pod, uh, and I hope to have him on again, the pitching coach, Mel, Mel Stoudemire, and Don Mattingly, who's the manager, who I want to eventually have on as well. Do you see them staying with the team? Do you see them keeping the team? Or if they don't do any – if they say save the Marlins flunk next year, which I'm hoping not, I hope they make the playoffs – because Mel, St- Mel Stoudemire, I had, is a great guy. Mm-hmm. And he turned that pitching staff around. Can they stay as a stable unit with the Marlins? Yeah, well, Mattingly had his contract extended. And by the way, I'll put in a good word uh, to Mattingly for you, for him to come on uh, you. with you. Because he's. Uh, I, I actually uh, b- began my association – with Don Mattingly back in 1987 because mm-hmm. uh, 87 and 88, I did uh, the Yankees radio on WABC radio. 
And mm-hmm. in 1989, I did the Yankees uh, for uh, Madison Square Garden Network uh, with Bobby Mercer. So uh, I got to see Mattingly at his prime. As a matter of fact, I was there the year, and I believe it was 87, the year he homered in uh, eight straight games. He actually hit 10 home runs in those mm-hmm. eight straight ball games. And he also, this is a great trivia question, he also hit six grand slams that year, 1987. Oh. And believe it or not, those are the only grand slams he's ever hit. So really? uh, it, it's incredible. So I, I've always had a good rapport uh, with, with Don Mattingly, and it's fun to be around him. And during the whole COVID stuff, it, that was probably the thing I and all other broadcasters missed the most, mm. the opportunity to get down in the dugout and talk to uh, the players and talk to Mattingly uh, before the game. And as far as Mel Stottlemyre Jr., he's considered one of the better pitching coaches uh, in the game, and he has some really good young talent uh, oh, yes. with uh, yes. Pablo Lopez and Sandy mm-hmm. Alcantara and Sixto, yep. Sixto Sanchez. So he's got some good arms to work with, and, and I see those two guys working together for a while. Exactly. Now I want to talk about the attendance because we have the same issue over here, With especially you you were up here. You know it. You, 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 you were up here in the Dunedin area for a while, like you said. Uh, 275 with the traffic for the trop is unbearable. Nobody wants to go out to the games. I'm sure that's the same way with your new stadium that you guys built. The old ownership did not do right in building that stadium here. I'm sorry. Do you think that's a key component too? Because seeing the uh, photos from outside when you guys do uh, the broadcast, it looks like it's difficult to get in. Do you think that's a key component to why nobody goes out to your games? Well, that, boy, there are a lot of a lot of components, and uh, I, I, I hate to stick up for the prior ownership because it was the prior ownership that was responsible for my departure for a couple of years. But when they wanted to to get a stadium built, uh, obviously, the best choice would have been somewhere in Broward County, uh, mm-hmm. in the middle, in the middle of both Dade County and Palm Beach County. But Broward County had uh, uh, divvied out a lot of money for the hockey arena, and it just wasn't going to happen. I mean, there were a couple of areas in Broward County that everybody said, oh, that would be a great place. And it just didn't happen. And one or two of the other areas in Miami, uh, people didn't really uh, respond to. So the, the bottom line, it is what it is. If you get there, it's a really cool ballpark. Uh, I hate to say this, but much better than the Trop. I mean, it's a retractable dome. I agree. By the photos, it looks it. Yeah. A yeah. Retractable dome. It, it has the the sliding windows out in left field that uh, allow light to come in. I mean, you can see thunder and lightning when you're in there, and it's a nice day. If it's a nice mm-hmm. day and not too hot, they open up the uh, the dome. Uh, Brightline, the uh, train uh, train Brightline has helped because Brightline stops you right in Miami and you can take Uber or a cab and it's about five minutes to get to the ballpark. So I always tell people that's a good way to come. I tell people, if you come one time, there are a lot of people who complain about the location of the ballpark and they've never been. I say, come one time and then give me your, your analysis of the ballpark. Did you like it? Did you like your experience? Uh, There are a lot of things to do. I like the fact that you can, circle on the concourse level you can circle all the way around the ballpark and continue to watch the game uh, because they have monitors all around so i I always tell people to do that Um, the 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 thing about south florida in the miami area there are, are so many transplants from new york new jersey philadelphia I think where, where they may have missed the boat is, is they thought when all these people moved to uh, Florida, that they mm-hmm. were going to become Marlin fans. Well, if a family, if a guy moved his family from New York and he was a Yankee fan and he grew up a Yankee fan, his kids are probably going to be Yankee fans. So I right. always say, okay. I always say, okay, that's all right. They can be Yankee fans, but they need a National League team. So they yeah. can be Marlins fans in the National League. So uh, South Florida is a winning area. If you win, people will come out. Uh, so hopefully if a better product is put on the field, 
and they have a better winning percentage, then the attendance will will just follow that along. Now let's talk a little about the NL East, the division you guys are in. That division is loaded and stacked. I know the Nationals had an off year, but they're still stacked with Juan Soto, Steven Strasburg, all them guys. You got the Mets, who's got a new GM now. Billy Apple, I think, will change that team around. You got Lindor still there. I mean, for a long time, a while there. Then you got, of course, Phillies with Harper, Gregorius, and them. And, of course, the World Series champs. I mean, you guys are in a loaded, stacked division. How do you see the Marlins ranking up to them? And do you see them overthrowing those guys in the near future with with all these young, bright stars that the Marlins are bringing up? I would say right now that uh, a number of those teams in the National League East that you mentioned, without question, would take the top three or four starters pitchers that the Marlins have. They would take that. Where the Marlins mm-hmm. lack was offense. And if if their pitching continues, and I know they're going to try to build up a bullpen too to back that up, but they need offense. They're, they're, it's, it's very obvious. They, they ranked uh, uh, very low in striking out the most. They ranked low in walking the fewest times. Their slugging percentage wasn't much. Don't hit a lot of home runs. They need that. And I think if they're able to again, through trades or free agency, put together some offense, I really think they can compete with those teams because of the starting pitching that they have. Do you think Do you think Jeter will spend to get those free agents, or do you think he'll do like what he's been doing by drafting? Well, there, there's a couple ways to do it. I think I think we will see more, uh, more spending this year. Uh, can he compete with the Yankees and the Dodgers and teams like that? No, he can't do that. But – I think we'll see more spending this year. And I think another area that they've built up is their minor league system. Their minor league system right now is uh, top five, I think in baseball. Yeah. And yeah, so, the, yeah, yeah, my Padres and Rays are one and two. Your Padres. And, I thought they were Ted Leitner's Padres. Okay. But we'll, we'll get back to that. We'll go but, there. We'll go back to that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but when you do that, now other teams can come at you and you can say, you have some talent in the minor leagues to, trade to get a big league ready player so Mm -hmm. that's another area that the marlins have done i think this will be the fifth year now for for derek jeter and his group but they've improved in that area and that helps you make trades now i hate to bring this up because (laughs) this was uh i want to say people will say this is an asterisk on the marlins i don't think so but in (laughs) both three I know you weren't. I, this was in the playoffs. I know you weren't broadcasting on TV, but you were there. I was there. Were, yeah, you were there. You know where I'm going at. I the know Steve where you're Bart- going. Yeah, the Steve Bartman. Uh, old old story. <laughs> nobody nobody talks about the 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 big double that uh, Mike Mordecai got, or, or the or the error that Alex Gonzalez made that would have ended the inning on a double play. <laughs> Oh, but so, everybody's everybody's got to go there. What was I, I, you, you? Hey, there there are other teams that have won World Series where you can say the same thing. The Don Denkinger play, the umpire who blew a call at first base in the Kansas City World Series. There there are plays or umpire calls that can be said in a lot of different World Series. And all I can say is the Marlins have won more World Series uh, in the last twenty years than the Atlanta Braves. Twenty five years than the Braves. So there you that go. Is that is true. <laughs> But what do you say to those fans that still go to that call and say that's an ask? I say get over it. That's it. Get <laughs> over it. <laughs> yeah, because uh, I I agree. I mean, it was, it's done. It's done. It, I mean, like you said, nobody nobody cares. About hey, first it. of all, first of all, forget about Bartman. You see, you got me going here, and people always love to do that to me. If <laughs> if you come in, if you have a lead in the series, and you come back home to Chicago to Wrigley Field, right, and right. you've got Car- Carrie Wood pitching uh, one game and all of a sudden the other ace starter has uh, 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 slipped my mind. Go Their other top starter pitching the second game and you can't you win one of them. I think you guys had Beckett. Oh, no, the Marlins had Be- Beckett in, in uh, 03 in, in uh, Yankee Stadium. But oh. but but the, the Cubs couldn't win one of those two games with those two guys pitching. So uh, Bartman is, a, is history and that's just old news. 
Yeah, I, <laughs> I agree. I sorry I had to bring that up. I mean, it's everybody right. goes to that, but I don't. I because I, nobody cares, like you said, about the other plays. I mean, it could have, you know, nobody cares about that. <laughs> but um, what about the Mark Pryor? That was the other picture. There you go. There you go. See, you it takes there. a little longer nowadays, exactly. but they come every once in a while. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> now you were there also for the other title in 97 against the mm -hmm. Indians. What do you remember that year about that team? Because they weren't really projected to win. I recall at all. They weren't projected to go far at all, not go into playoffs. They weren't projected to win the world series. They weren't projected to do anything. What do you remember about that year? Well, there was a, a really good mix of uh, uh, veteran guys uh, with uh, Moise Salou, uh, Bobby Bonilla, uh, Charles Johnson, uh, Devon White in center field, Gary Sheffield, uh, uh, Edgar Renteria was uh, solid at short. So they had a good mix. Kevin Brown was one of the nastiest uh, right-handers that I've seen in quite a while. And he anchored that uh, staff. Al Leiter was yep. there. And yep. and so it was – and and people will talk about the team, but I, I loved being around Jim Leland. He was the manager that year. And Jim Leland was the kind of manager – I used to watch him. We'd be up in the booth uh, getting ready to, to get our scorecard ready and everything. And, and mm. during batting practice, Jim Leland was the type of manager – he'd make a point – to kind of go around, he'd have his fungo bat on his side, and he'd he'd go around and talk to just about everybody uh, uh, on on his ball club during during BP, just to kind of let them know if the guy, especially the guys who maybe weren't in the lineup, weren't playing all the time. And mm -hmm. uh, I think guys really, he was a great players manager. They loved playing for Jim Leland. So who, so out of all your calls that you've had with, because um, you were there most of the. Most of the time with Rich Waltz, another guy who I'm going to have soon on here. Uh, out of all the calls you've had, I know there's plenty of few you can say that you at least remember the most. At least give a few that you remember the most, your your top two. Well, I, I don't know about particular calls because a lot of times a call is more or more often made by the play-by-play -play guy. When you have Rich Waltz, he would be the the one to ask. I, I always remember, and it, and it was a great uh, fan favorite. They they loved it when the Marlins acquired through the Rule Five draft. It was amazing how they got this guy Dan Ugla, and mm -hmm. he he had a four or five year stretch uh, with the Marlins. He had power. He had thirty home runs, and his first year uh, with the club, a lot of people would mispronounce his name. We'd hear it on TV and yep. other, bro other broadcasters uh, when we'd play other teams would come up to us and they say, how do you pronounce this guy's name? Cause Ugla, Dan Ugla. So one night, and I don't know how it happened. Um, he hit, he hits a bomb at uh, pro player stadium. And as he's rounding, rounding the bases, Rich looks at me and I, I, it was like I knew what he was going to say. And, he, and, and Rich says, and his name is like we said it like we were mad. And his name is Dan Ugla. So from that moment on, every time he hit a, hit a blast, we'd say that. So we, we had a lot of fun with that. Oh, man, whatever happened to him? He, like, he just like disappeared <laughs> after, what, years in Atlanta? Like yeah, he after, went to he went to Washington, I think, then Atlanta, and then yeah. But he had he had a solid career um, with the Marlins. Yeah, he did. He did. So now let's get into your uh, playing career. You obviously, like you said, you played for about five or six different teams. Uh, out of all the out of all the places that you played for, where did you enjoy playing the most, and what stadium? Well, it's two things. First of all, I signed out of high school uh, as an 18-year-old with the Dodgers. And this was actually before the draft. So you, at that time, if you were a really good high school player, you, you had your choice of numerous teams. I had a couple other teams that were interested, but I grew up in Los Angeles. So I, I followed the Dodgers, and they, they were like my favorite team. I could name all all the guys back in the sixties who were on that club. 
And the mm -hmm. scout that scouted me in high school, it was his either first or second year scouting. And he ended up having a pretty good career. Tommy Lasorda was the scout that, that followed me through high school. So I, I signed with the Dodgers. He, he was at my house uh, when my you know, parents were there. And he used to, years past, fast forward, whenever I ran into Tommy, he would love to tell the story. He would tell people, I signed this young kid out of South Pasadena High School for $210,000. And I'd look at him. People would look because they'd say, wait a minute, that was back in 1964. $210,000, that's like we're three million now. Yeah. He goes, that's right. I gave him $10,000 cash and $200,000 worth of advice. <laughs> <laughs> so he used to love to tell that story. But that's who I started with. And most of my career in the minor leagues was coming up in the minor leagues with all the, the like, we had a team uh, in AAA. Well, mm -hmm. I, first of all, I'll start in A-ball. One of my teammates in A-ball was Don Sutton. Don Sutton was was so good. Uh, he was, I believe, eight and one, like in June in, mm -hmm. in the California League. We were in Santa Barbara playing teams like Stockton and Bakersfield, San Jose. And Don mm -hmm. Sutton was was uh, eight and one with a one something ERA. And of his 10 or 11 starts, nine of them were complete games. So a whole different ball game back then. Oh, yeah. So by far. They took him up to double A and he won 15 games in double A. So his first year in pro ball, he threw 250 innings and he won 23 games. Never, never to look back at the minor leagues anymore. So he was a great teammate in a ball. And then in triple A, I played with all that, like one year, our infield was Ron say at third, uh, Bill Russell or Bobby Valentine, depending on the year. Davey Lopes. Davey Lopes was our second baseman. I played first base. Uh, we had Bill Buckner in the outfield, uh, Tom Pashorek, um, Bob Stim Stinson was a catcher. We had uh, uh, who do we have? Oh, we had Charlie Huff as a pitcher. So we had some good teams. And and Tommy Lasorda. I got to reunite with Tommy back then. He was my manager for three years in AAA. Mm -hmm. So I got to play with all those teams. We had in 1970 or 71, we were voted the best, I think it was 70, voted the best minor league team of the century uh, because everybody in the starting lineup had at least a 10-year major league career, which is pretty unheard of. So, yeah, yeah you, were, you were a part of that good, good, good teams. Uh, how, uh, how do you think it did not pan out in the uh, – in the championships or in the playoffs, what what do you think happened in the playoffs? With the uh, with the Phillies, yeah, or with the Phillies, you know, we had uh, just got beat seventy six. We got beat uh, by the uh, Cincinnati Reds, the uh, big red machine. Oh yeah, the big and red. I forgot. About it. You can't forget about so that. It's that? tough to get. It was tough to get by those guys. I think they beat us. Uh, it was two out of three, and they they they, they took care of us easily in seventy seven. We lost out to the Dodgers. They went on to win the World Series in 77. I was with some teams that were close all the time. Then, then I went on to the Montreal Expos. And the Expos in 79 got beat the last weekend of the season by the Pirates. Mm -hmm. And the Pirates went on to win the World Series in 79. In 1980, they got beat the last weekend of the season on a big Mike Schmidt home run by the Phillies. The Phillies won the world series in 80 and in 81, they got beat by the Dodgers in the championship series and the Dodgers won the world series. So I was with some teams that were really good teams. Uh, I mean, the Expos had, had Gary Carter and Andre Dawson and Tim Raines, uh, Ellis Valentine, uh, the, the Phillies with Schmidt and Steve Carlton, Bob Boone, Larry Boa, so some good teams that were always close. I never got in a World Series, but I, I got in some postseason a little bit. Now, tell me if this is true. This is what I'm seeing. 
Uh -oh. You were one of the very few that dominated, I guess, Hall of Fame pitcher Tom Seaver. God bless his soul, who just passed. Yeah. You had very good success against him. Is that true? Yeah, it is true. See, the, you can't always believe everything you read, but that that part you can be, you can believe. You know, um, it was funny. It was uh, one of those things where in 72, my first full year in the big leagues, I faced him a few times, and I wasn't the regu regular or everyday first baseman, but I'd get some at-bats, and I had, I had some success against him. So the next year, 73, uh, we had uh, Willie Montanez, uh, Dick Allen came a little bit later, and mm -hmm. I wasn't scheduled to start opening day. I wasn't going to be the everyday first baseman, but we opened the season in New York, uh, Steve Carlton against Tom Seaver, opening day. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hit cleanup in the lineup opening day <laughs> against Tom Seaver. So, uh, yeah, I had – it was one of those things where I'd go, uh, you know, maybe not playing a lot, doing some pinch hitting all of a sudden we'd have a series against the Mets Seaver would be uh, uh gonna pitch the second game of the series and guys would go oh, you'll you'll be in the lineup uh, you'll be in the lineup you'll probably get two or three hits so all of a sudden it just becomes a mental thing and and that's that's a good part of it and that was it was fun for me to have success against a guy like that who was not a, not only a great pitcher an incredible human being too do you remember your average that you had against him? If this is indeed what I'm seeing is true, do you remember what you batted against him? Well, it was over 300. It was over yep. 300. 320. Yeah, and and I do know that I had three of three of my 22 career home runs against yep. him. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and 15 runs batted against him. And yeah. Against and him. and back then nobody cared about the OPS, but it was probably good too. Oh yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. You're right on that. So also, I'm seeing this too. Uh, you're notable for never giving getting hit by a pitch in your career. Is never. That I was that showed that showed what a feared feared hitter that I was. Nobody threw at me. Uh, nobody wanted to hit me. Put me on, and uh, I, I don't know how that happened because I was hit often in the minor leagues. I would get hit, mm -hmm. but uh, at the big league level, no. The the other because of where you are, the other bit of trivia that I. I I bet you don't know, and it might not be in your notes, is that I am the only person to have played for and broadcast for both Canadian teams, the Expos and the Blue Jays. There are a lot of players. Yep, I did not know. See, a lot of guys have played for both teams. A lot of guys have played for both teams. But I played for both the Expos and the Blue Jays, and I broadcast for both the Expos and the Blue Jays. Yep, and like you said, I did not know that. So, <laughs> yeah, not, not many people can say that, and you're 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 one of the very few that can say that. Yeah. So yeah. So that's crazy. <laughs> so an over close to a thousand games, you compiled the two forty eight average, one hundred ninety six runs. 22 home runs and 106 RBI. Do you think you feel like you had a successful career in the majors? Yeah, you know what? As you get older, you you look back on it and feel feel more proud of what you did at the time. Uh, even shortly after I finished playing, but I did have a our one of our stat stat guys figured something out for me one time because mm -hmm. they're over they're over 20,000 guys who have ever played major league baseball. And I asked him one time, I said, how many of those 20,000 played 10 years or more, which I was able to do. And right. it's only about a third. It's only about a third of that. So uh, that made me feel a little bit better too. So I, I was proud of the, the fact that I, I knew at one point I wasn't going to be an everyday player. And so I, I worked on my, my pinch hitting uh, skills, my, my defense, I could play all the outfield spots. I played first base, good defense. So if I worked on those things, I, I was able to stay on a roster. And I was always one of the guys who who was working hard toward the end of spring training because I didn't know if I was going to make the team or not. So right. uh, back back then, one-year contracts, you never knew. Uh, so fortunately, I did and, and ended up, uh, you know, having a, a pretty decent career. Now, um 
I got I I gotta ask you this. I know. Do you think? Do you think there's a possibility? I know you're in the era you played. Um, is it a possible chance you yeah. could possibly be in the Hall of Fame sometime, or no? Depending on. I don't know. I know it's a tough subject area because of the different eras, but with your stats, I mean, those are decent stats, especially for your era. I could see probably not not Hall of Fame stats. Trust me. Maybe my wife's Hall of Fame. Maybe, maybe, maybe my granddaughter's Hall of Fame. Maybe there. I'll take that. I'll be happy with that. <laughs> there you go. There you go. But like you said, you did also have a good fielding percentage. Like you said. I'm looking at this. You almost had a damn near thousand fielding percentage throughout your whole career. That's saying something. Yeah, I wasn't a big guy, but I was able. I I, I took pride in the way I played first base, and uh, uh, I always I remember um, Bobby Valentine was our shortstop two different years in uh, AAA. In the first year he, he was there, uh, 1969 actually, he he made. I want to say over 50 errors because mm. he had, he had been an outfielder. And so they moved him in to play shortstop. And he used to tell when I'd run into him when he was managing the Mets or wherever, he'd always tell people I, I'd have made 75 if, if you hadn't have been over at first base. So I, I always appreciated that. He always recognized that. <coughs> Excuse me. So, we obviously talked about who you dominated, the pitcher, obviously, Tom Seaver. We just read that. Who was the pitcher that gave you the most fits, struck you <laughs> out every time, or you did not have a good batting average against? Do you, do you remember? Well, you, you know, you, you just gave my average 248, so you got to figure a lot of pitchers dominated me. Uh, you know you know what's interesting? I, I actually had a good average against Bob Gibson. I had a uh, a pretty good average against a couple other guys who were well known pitchers, but mm -hmm. I, I and and this is when I looked back one time, I would have not guessed this, but I think I was like one for eighteen against Phil Necro, and I was maybe one for fifteen against Doc Ellis, a guy like that. So there there were some guys that you know you you think maybe you did better against that you really didn't. Uh, but, uh, yeah, some of those guys, I had trouble toward, toward the end of my career and it was one of the first, uh, really split finger pitches we saw a lot of, I had trouble with Bruce Suter, uh, when he came up and he, he was tough and he, he's in the hall of fame. So, you know, the, the guys that threw really hard, like, I think I was, uh, two for eight with a couple of doubles against Nolan Ryan. So, you know, he threw hard. But if he had his curveball working, everybody was in trouble, including myself. But if he just had his fastball working, I, I had a chance. Now, your era was the stadiums, uh, football stadiums. Yeah. What would, what, would, what, would, what would you say out of all those football stadiums you played in, what was the most difficult to hit? Yeah, they, they all looked the same. You know, you had St. Louis and, and Cincinnati and Pittsburgh and Philadelphia where I played. Yeah. Um, I spent time in Montreal, Olympic Stadium. Yep. Uh, it, it, at that time, they didn't have the roof, and so it could get really cold and damp in there. I thought it was tough to hit there. Um, it was always tough to hit uh, in San Francisco because uh, of the wind. Uh, so yeah, some of those some of those ballparks, San Francisco was really tough. I remember in I think it was 1975, Willie Montanez. Wow. was with the Phillies mm -hmm. and he got traded to the giants for Gary Maddox. Mm -hmm. And matter of fact, Willie was on the bus. We were getting ready to, to leave, to go to the airport. And the general manager, Paul Owens came on the bus and called Willie over and said, Hey, he just got traded. So a couple of months later we're playing and Willie was funny. Willie had a, had a great sense of humor. He was from Puerto Rico, a little broken English and mm -hmm. a little bit of a lisp when he, when he spoke, so, so he, so he talked funny, he talked real fast and we're in San Francisco and the giants dugout is on the first base side and the visiting dugouts over on the third base side at candlestick, a lot of foul territory, a lot of wind. And I forget somebody hit a pop fly and I'm playing first base and I'm drifting back into foul territory and I'm going, I got it. I got it. I got it. 
and all of a sudden the ball drops about 15 feet from me. And I hear Willie from the Giants dugout going, no, you don't, no, you don't. <laughs> I'm so glad those stadiums are no more. That, those, <laughs> those stadiums had to be hard to play in, had to be. Yeah, they were, they were tough. They were tough. That was, the, the thing is, though, they were all the same. So at least if you go to stadiums now, they're different. You know, like, like Philadelphia has different angles yeah. than Washington. Right. Uh, uh, so the, at least back then, the circular stadiums were all the same. But if you, right. if you were in the outfield on a, in a circular stadium with AstroTurf and you were a corner outfielder and you went over to the corner and the ball got by you, it, it was like in a hockey rink. The ball would right. go all the way to center field and you were in trouble. Now I see after you retired from the game, you did a little broadcasting work with ESPN and NBC. Uh, do you have any stories from your times there with ESPN and NBC? Well, mainly with the – NBC did a game of the week once in a while. I do do uh, some of that. But mainly with, with ESPN because they put me on – the West Coast game. They were doing – it was 1990, and it was the first year ESPN did baseball. Mm -hmm. And they assigned me to uh, a Tuesday night game on the West Coast. So it would be San Diego, L.A., Oakland, Seattle, San Francisco. Be out there. Be out in the West Coast. That sounded like fun, <clears throat> except – I was also working for Toronto mm -hmm. and doing Blue Jays baseball on CBC. Mm -hmm. CBC did a Wednesday night game. So I'm Tuesday night on the West Coast. And I, re I always remember this. We had a West Coast game at Dodger Stadium. And Wednesday night, I had a Toronto game at Yankee Stadium. Mm -hmm. And I show up at the ballpark at Yankee Stadium and Guys on the Blue Jays are going, weren't you just at Dodger Stadium last night? And I, yeah, I was. But the fun part about that, my partner on those games had never done baseball before. Mm -hmm. Chris Berman. Oh, yeah. Everybody Berman. knows Chris Berman. Berman and yeah. he, he, he's, he's a love of the party. Everybody loves being around him. He loves but he his football. Oh, he loves his football. But he's never done baseball. Right. So he, he would, and he would love to talk to guys. That was back in the era when he had nicknames for everybody. Oh, and yeah. uh, he'd always be around the batting cage and everybody know, knew him and recognized him and he'd be talking to him. And I'd go down and get my work done and go up to the booth. And our producer would be going, where's Boomer? Where's Boomer? And I'd go, he's, he's down on the field. He's talking to, we got, we got to do the open in 10 minutes. And I'll tell you what a pro he, he is. He would show up. He'd get up to the booth. We'd get our two or three topics. We'd do a live open, and he would nail it every time. So, uh, But he, to this day, and that was, think about it, that was 1990. To this day, we talk to each other every year, opening day. Yeah, I, I, I wish I knew... I wish I, I know there's ropes between ESPN and trying to get people on, but that was one that I was trying to get. <laughs> no, seriously, Berman was like growing up, growing up in the 90s that I was, and since I'm still young, obviously 30, but I, I, he, he was one I listened to mainly on uh, when he was doing NFL, right? Yep. Uh, prime time and countdown and then i think he started yeah like you said in the early 90s i, I uh doing the baseball because you worked with him uh doing i what was it wednesday you said tuesday wednesday night, night. Tuesday, he okay. would call it he would call it uh, uh hotel california See, yes, yeah. he, he nicknamed it hotel california i'll tell you one thing he'll always tell this story because he was such a novice at doing baseball we're doing a game the dodgers and the phillies dodger stadium Dodgers have about a not eight or nine run lead in mm -hmm. the sixth in, in the sixth inning. Mm -hmm. He quits keeping score. Yeah, I always keep score. You never know. Right. Phillies come back to win the game, and he's he's looking over my score sheet. He's going to 
So he, t- he always tells me that he learned his lesson to always keep score regardless of what the score of the game was. But, uh, yeah, he, he was fun to work with. Oh, I, I, I know. I just wish I knew how I, – because I know they're strict over there at ESPN on who they get. And we're to get to do podcasts and I was, uh, that's just definitely for some time in the future on my bucket list is to get him. Well, see, and, you had to go through a lot of channels to get me, right? <laughs> exactly. Well, I did. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, well, honestly, no, not really. Cause you got Twitter. <laughs> Herman don't have none of that. He don't have. Yeah. 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 So it's hard. I literally have to look. Somewhere on ESPN, I don't know who or where. I have to connect with somebody from ESPN just to try and get a hold of him. <laughs> but yeah, he's definitely he's he's definitely a character for sure. I love I oh, love yeah. his call. I love his calls, like uh, especially when he did the home run derby. Oh yeah, derby back 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 gone. But you're you are right. Football is his. He loves baseball, but football is is his is love. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and also, I see you did calls with Gary Thorne, too. Mm-hmm. He was also ESPN, too, there for a while. Yeah, Gary Gary and I did uh, 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 some ESPN games together. And then we also, one year, did the uh, – well, I, I know what year it was because it was 2000, uh, the, the Yankee Met World Series. Yeah. And, and uh, we did that for MLB International. And it mm-hmm. was kind of interesting because – it was a, a broadcast that is fed across the entire world. So mm-hmm. we were actually heard by and seen by more people than uh, whoever was doing the Fox feed for the United States. But nobody right. knew it. <laughs> right. Nobody knew it unless they were over in Germany watching a game or something. But uh, so, yeah, I worked with Gary. Real professional, uh, terrific guy. That's the one thing about this business. I've I've been able to work with, with some good guys, yeah. Really good guys. I I mean I even with the Marlins, I started working with Dave O'Brien. Dave is now with yes. Nesson and does Red well, Sox I think games. ESPN too, still. He did a lot of ESPN. Then yeah. I worked with Len Casper. Uh Len yep. moved on to do the Cubs. Yep. And now he's doing the White Sox. Uh yep. worked with Rich Rich Waltz and I for eleven years. Uh, we did Marlins games. And then even prior to that, uh, I worked with, uh, when I mentioned I was with the Yankees for three years, the two years on radio, worked with one of the, I learned a lot from this guy too, from from uh, Hank Greenwald. Uh, he's mm-hmm. passed away, but Hank and I did the Yankee games for uh, from 87, 88. Got to work with Bobby Mercer in 1989. Um then I started in Montreal with a Hall of Fame announcer, Dave Van Horn, who is uh, who still does some Marlins games. So in my first uh, TV experience in Montreal, my partner, it was his first year of doing broadcasting, was Ken Singleton, who's had a great career uh, doing Yankee baseball. So, yeah, I've been yeah. – hey, when you have good partners, you end up being okay. <laughs> yeah, which you which you have, and look how successful you've been, and you've been doing it for how many years now? <laughs> uh well, yeah, I've been in baseball over fifty five. So, broadcasting, you subtract seventeen from fifty five. That uh, I can't do that right now. So exactly, and and like I said, <clears throat> before Gary did baseball with you, I think he was, I think he his main calling was also hockey. When yeah, uh, when. ESPN was fully embedded in that before they lost the rights to it. Uh, he was in, he was involved with that, but baseball, I think it was where he got his actual start. Like you said, uh, with you, I believe was his first experience with baseball. So, yeah. Some other guys, I'm just thinking of other guys that have gone on to have really nice career. Bob Carpenter did a lot of games with Bob. He's, he's been the nationals. Yeah, uh, national, TV voice yeah. for a long time. Uh, a guy who used to do Met baseball years ago, Steve Zabriskie, uh, worked with Steve. So uh, yeah, there've been been a lot of fun people. So I had a lot of fun uh, one year because we were such good friends uh, until he passed away. Mm-hmm. Uh, Gary Carter and I got to broadcast some of the uh, senior league baseball games on Sunshine Network in Florida. And that mm-hmm. was, we had a lot of fun doing that. 
<laughs> I bet. <laughs> <laughs> so you like like you said, you played in Montreal. You also broadcasted in Montreal. What do you think about this uh, Rays thing with they want to be the first team to do this, just like they want to be the first to do everything, half and half. What do you think that does to a fan base, and do you think that will actually work? Well, it probably would work more with the fan base than it would with the players. Um, I, I just can't see a player and his family – because one thing about a season, you have spring. Usually, you have spring training in one city, and if you have a young family, a lot of players have young young kids. You've got to move them to uh, the city you're playing in. You got to get a lease. Because trust me, I've I've been in that situation when I got traded from Toronto to Montreal. I had, had yeah. I had to get to Montreal. My wife had to stay back with a six month old baby and get yeah. out of the lease. Uh, get the furniture that we lease back to the place and, and do all that. So I just don't see how logistically it would work for, for families. Uh, maybe they don't care too much about that. Players would probably adjust to it. And I think the, the fans up in Montreal would adjust to it. They would love to have major league baseball back there. What? I don't get the whole, why'd they lose it to begin with? Was it because the fans weren't going? What? Yeah. Why'd they why they lose Montreal to go to well, Washington? Well, the 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 years that I was there, the the they had had great fans of the fame out. I mean, people think it, it's always been like that, but toward the end, the fan base really dwindled. Uh, the old Olympic Stadium uh, had had really gone down, and people mm-hmm. wanted a new ballpark, possibly downtown. It's a perfect city to have a ballpark downtown because that's where all the action is in Montreal. And so that was part of it, just the, the stadium and the fact that uh, they had, had had success. And then that part of it went away. And it was unfortunate because in, in the late seventies and in the nineties, when they had that team that uh, because of the strike couldn't go to the world series, they had great fans. They draw 30, 40, 50,000 a game. Now, do you see baseball doing that again and having another strike? Because that would, that was the thing with a uh, couple – with no, last year, yeah, with last year, with the uh, fighting between players and the owners, not coming up with games or whatever to pay. Do you see that happening again? Do you see another strike? Well, they're talking about a lockout, which would be the owners locking out the players. I don't see the players striking, and I think – they're at a level now where where salaries are certainly fine. They're just other things they they want to fine tune, and I think they realize that any work stoppage is not good. And if if they stop it like December first, that's not going to affect anything. Uh, and and once spring training gets going, uh, I think they would, in my opinion, they'd be crazy. The players would, the union, to to strike, and I don't think that's going to happen. Now, do you see the era of contracts like the pools and all that and uh, who else? Alex Rodriguez and all of them. Do you see those contracts being gone? Like the, the long tenure? ones, the 10-year the ones, yeah. Uh, I think there, there still will be guys that get over $30 million a year, but I don't think anybody's going to get a 10-year contract, even some of these shortstops that, that are available right now. Uh, I mean, I'd be surprised because I think – you see every year that the, the last two or three years of those contracts usually are not good, uh, it, only for the player uh, because he's making pretty good money. But uh, I see more contracts that might be for more money, but fewer years. Now you witnessed a young, a young Miggy. How, how, how long do you see him playing for? Or do you see them or do you see him retiring after this year? Well, I know he wants to get to 3,000 hits, and he's not too far away. Uh, so he, I'm sure he'll get to it in the first first month of the season next year. But I'm not quite sure how many more. He still has a couple more years, maybe three, left on his contract. So I, I would imagine he'll try to play and continue to play as long as the contract's there. Uh, it, it all depends on – he's gotten himself in a little better shape. But, you know, again – the last couple of years for him have not been like the first few years. And that's just going to happen. Saw the same thing with pool holes as well. 
Now, we talked about a little, like you said, you couldn't last year go to games. How do you think that took out on the players with not having fans and <laughs> an automa- automated, fan, uh, automated fan noise? Does I mean, did that, do you think that hurt the players? Do you think it felt like practice? How do you think the players felt during that? Time. Well, players are, are are geared to adjust. That's how you, how you manage to, to stay in the game. And I think they adjusted after a while. But I'll tell you what, it, early on, it, it just sounded weird. It looked weird. And I'm sure early on, the first few weeks, I'm sure the players had a lot of trouble with it. Would you have, would you have a problem with it? Or would yeah, because I enjoyed the fans. Yeah, I, I would have had trouble with that. I remember one time. In uh, in Chicago, Wrigley Field, the bleachers would always fill up mm-hmm. first because the fans had come in there. So if you were taking batting practice, the visiting team. Oh, lost him. Well, hold on, folks. Why get him back? Yeah, what happened? happened? Yeah, I don't know what happened there. I had a connection. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. So, I forget. Where were we? Well, we were at Wrigley Field. We were at Wrigley Field. (laughs) I used to love the fans at Wrigley Field. and They were all there early, and we were uh, taking batting practice, so I was shagging in right field. and I told them that I gave them some balls. I threw some balls up to them, and I said, hey – if I get a chance to pinch it in this game, I want you to give me a standing ovation. And sure enough, sixth, seventh inning, I came in to pinch it. Nobody could figure out why his group in right field was <laughs> standing. <laughs> so I would have missed not having fans in the ballpark. Yes. Yeah, that was a crazy time. I hope I hope I hope not to go back to that. That was weird for sure. <laughs> but hey, I mean, it was ended up being a good season. I mean, you had you had Rays Dodgers in the World Series. Yeah, and you know the Marlins hung on, and they they had a chance. They beat the Cubs the first yeah. round of the playoffs, so they they played well. That's why I think this year was disappointment for them because a lot of people thought they would, you know, carry that over a little bit. Now, uh, tell us more about since you witnessed it. Tell us more about the young talent they have besides the three you just mentioned. Where do you? How do you, do you see them fitting in the light in the in the lineups and pitching? Because you got a lot of young players. Well, the pitching is going to be there, and I think if you talk talk about young players, we we got a chance last year to see Lewin Diaz, yep. uh, Jesus Sanchez, yep. and Brian De La Cruz, yep. and I don't know if all three of them will turn out to be solid hitters, but you you hope a couple of them do. And, and you got the Mesa's coming up too soon. And who's that? Both the Mesa's. Yeah, one one of the Mesa's, the youngest one, is actually everybody feels is going to be the better player. The other kid that has absolutely torn up the Arizona Fall League is J.J. Blade. Yep. And uh, yep. he's, uh, as far as home runs, RBIs, his OPS over 1,000 in the uh, AFL. Uh, he was the uh, MVP of their All-Star game. Hit a home run, had an RBI base hit. He's another. So they got some bats coming up, but if you can't depend on those, if just four guys there, uh, all panning out, and you you certainly don't want to do that for this year. So that's why I think you've got to insert a free agent or somebody in a trade, at least one bat to help out the offense. Now, what about the two longer tenure guys that have been there, like a Brian Anderson and Garrett Cooper? Do you, do you see them? Couple, yeah, see that's them good staying? questions. You know, I think uh, Garrett Cooper has a chance if, if, and I'm pretty sure the DH will probably uh, come into play in the National yeah. League. Yeah. 
So if you have Garrett Cooper, if you have Lewin Diaz, a couple guys at first base, you also have Jesus Aguilar too, though. So it's uh, right. that's an interesting decision. Brian Anderson's a tough one. He, he's had injuries the last couple of years. Yep. He's a solid yep. player. He's a good guy. Uh, you you hope he can. You you look at third base as a power position. You'd love to see him hit twenty five home runs, and you just don't know if that's going to happen. I agree. Now, um, what about now? What about the uh, straight fire arms that you have? The three that we talked about earlier. Now, can you see them staying healthier? Do you see them with how hard they throw, throwing their arms out like a Strasburg did? Because now he's pretty much not the same. I don't no, think he's he not the same. No, a guy like Alcantara, uh, his mechanics, the way he throws, a lot different than Strasburg. I see him staying healthy. Uh, Pablo Lopez, I don't know. He's had injury problems every year. Uh, so he's a guy that you you struggle counting on him to give you 30 starts. Sixto Sanchez, who they were hoping to see last year, uh, was uh, hurt with injury. So uh, yeah. it, it's it's like that with all these young pitchers. There's always some injury. If 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 you get them all healthy, hey, you're going to be right there. But that's the key, and it a lot of it's a coin flip because you just don't know. Now let's talk about my Padres, like you said, mm-hmm. Ted Le- Ted Leitner's Padres, longtime radio voice man. Uh, you see them six times a year, uh, six six games a year. Yeah, we don't see them that much. Yeah, right. Uh, do you think last year, I think it was as a Padre fan, a total disappointment of a year? What do you think went wrong and can they bounce back? Yeah, I think they well, they had some injuries with you, Darvish. You know, he got hurt. Um, they, they certainly can bounce back. And I think one of the reasons they'll bounce back is because of the manager they just hired. Uh, very well respected, Bob Melvin. Uh, I. I I, I see. I tell you what. I see the Padres bouncing back, and I don't see the Giants doing what they did this year, or next year, with Posey retiring. Yeah, that was a surprise. Yeah, I was not yeah. seeing that. Yeah. They had everything fall into place, and I just don't think that's going to happen this coming no. year for them. So, and you're and you're right on the Melvin Melvin situation. I did not know he was open. He was open until I saw <laughs> something that the Athletics let him interview. I was like. Wow, really? Yeah. I didn't think he was I didn't think he I didn't think his contract was over. I didn't and I was just like that that's one of our biggest managers that we've had since since Bochi. Yeah, yeah. Or Bochy. Jack McKeon. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. So I think yeah, it was just accumulation of injuries. I mean, Will Myers, God bless him, he can't stay healthy. Yeah, that's how he was over here with the race. I mean, I like him. Hosmer, he can't stay healthy. I mean, he was a big part of the Royals winning it. And he just hasn't panned out. We signed him for four years. He's he's locked in, yeah. Yeah. But and, I think if you if again, if you have if everything falls into place the way it did for the Giants, if you get Hosmer, if he still stays healthy, Myers a little healthy, and you got Tatis, you got Machado. Uh, boy, I mean, there most teams would take that foursome and give it a shot. And plus, we got what, as we talked about earlier, with the Rays and the Padres being one and two in the farm system, we got guys coming up. And as as Don Orsillo would say, you got the crone zone too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, he would. <laughs> oh man, he, he him and him, him and him and Mudcat. Oh, they're great. God. They're good. They're a couple great guys, and they do a good job. Them two together, I thought you, I thought you and Rich were, were pretty good. You, they're up there, they're up there with you. Oh, they're 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 terrific. They are terrific. <laughs> Connect them with Scanlon. <laughs> <laughs> how'd you become? How'd you become a Padre fan down in uh, in the Bay Area, Tampa Bay? Tony Gwynn. Oh, okay. Watching Tony Gwynn. Tony Gwynn. I, you, you've heard all the stories on what a good guy Tony Gwynn was mm-hmm. one of the nicest ever to, to play yeah, the game. Got, you got to meet him. Oh, he, he was, uh, when he was doing some broadcasting, he was, uh, he was at the ballpark. We were in, in, uh, at pro player stadium 
and he was in the booth, the Padre booth. Mm-hmm. And my son, my son was with me. My son was probably at that time, 16, 17, interested in talking about hitting and stuff. So I said, Hey, you want to meet uh, Tony Gwynn? So go down and I introduced him to Tony. And next thing I know, my son's down in the booth talking to Tony Gwynn for like 30 minutes. He came back. He couldn't believe how, how nice he was. He's talking to him about hitting and everything. So yeah, it was well, one of the best. I, I honestly thought his kid was going to be better than him, but his, unfortunately his kid just didn't pan out in the majors, unfortunately. No, nah, that d- d- doesn't always happen. He, he, yeah, yeah, I'll tell you I mean, what, though, he, he sounds just like him on the radio, though. He does. Yeah. He does. Yeah. He sounds just like and looks like him, too. So you yeah. can tell it's simply father and son. Great. Com- uh, he, I, I, love, I love hearing him on the radio. And especially when he does on TV too, when he fills in for Mudcat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I know Mudcat don't. He's he's like you are. He's getting in that time frame of uh, I'm just going to take some time off. <laughs> well, you got to do that. You got you get to that point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I I don't blame you guys. I mean, 162 games a year. I mean, it's a it's a it's a full schedule to travel. All of yeah. us would. All the other guys would say the same thing. Yeah, it, it's, it's not struggling. the broadcasting of the games; it's the travel, right? The, that, uh, the, that the hours, yeah. the hours that are spent. Yeah, especially with the hotel, how you got to stay in the hotels, then you got to go to the go to the stadium, and then travel again. And I mean, look at us complaining about some guy who has to really put in a hard day's work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right there, you go. I mean, that that's a piece of cake, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um. Now what, let's talk a little bit about the Rays, since I'm, I'm of course in the Bay Area. You you were around when they were an expansion team. You were broadcasting obviously for the Marlins. Um, how much progress have you seen in them since they were that young expansion team in '98? Because they had tons of veterans trying to in the early stages there to try and, but they didn't have the pitching. They they had hitting, but not the pitching, like Wade Boggs, Conseco, McGriff, and all them guys. But how much progress have you seen in them since you saw them in the expansion? Well, I think they had to do that early on, uh, and a lot of expansion teams do that just to create a little interest. They bring in some players that people know know their names. Um, I'm just amazed at the uh, organization, the Rays organization, and how they continue to do it, how they continue to win 90 games. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kevin Cash obviously is, is a key uh, factor in that. But uh, they, they find a way, their analytic department, uh, they put things together with their pitching. They'll mix in a veteran guy. And it's, uh, it's amazing. And, and with a low payroll, uh, they do it every year. So. Uh, congrats to Kevin Cash for winning manager of the year for the second straight year. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Now, I think Mattingly, didn't he win that? And um, didn't he win that, I think, what, uh, last year for the He won last year with the Marlins going to yeah, playoffs. Yeah, by leading and, them to the playoffs, didn't yeah. he? And I'll tell you what, Don Mattingly, if you can't play for him, uh, there's something wrong with you because he, he's great with the players. Right. Uh, got a good demeanor. I see that. Yeah, and and I I know the guys love playing for him. It it just sucks he's not in the Hall of Fame. I gotta ask you, do you see him ever going in the Hall of Fame? I mean, uh, he's had a good you know, career. I he did, and I think as years go by, if more players, if Buster Posey goes in the Hall of Fame, Don Mattingly should go in the Hall he of should. Fame. He should, yeah, I because agree. Because all of a sudden, if I if agree. players players start going in. That, that didn't have the 18, 19 year careers. If they start going in, then okay, Don Mattingly deserves to be in there. Uh, so I, I know there's a debate with Buster Posey. A lot yeah. of people say he's a Hall of Famer. He does right. have all kinds of credentials. There's, there's no question about it. He, right. he, he's not had a long career. Then you have other players who get punished for having a long career. And, yep. and, and having good numbers, well, they just were uh, compilers. They just compiled numbers. 
Carlton Fisk played a long time, compiled a lot of numbers. That was another one I was going to say, yeah. Jim Cott, Jim Cott should be in the Hall of Fame, has 17 gold gloves. But, well, he played till he was 45. He, you know, did the you – know, so there's all kinds of debates on all that stuff. Yep. And But my yep. point on Mattingly is if they start allowing guys in like Posey, Mattingly should be in. I agree. I agree with you on that because you got players – you got players that uh, that have had good careers, but none of them just seem to go in. And I don't know why that is. I don't know if it's the voters, if it's the uh, uh, how they do the voting, but something's got to change in the voting. Like I know, God, I know what he did was wrong, and betting against baseball. But Pete Rose should honestly be in the Hall of Fame. Well, I'm it I'm one who believes that too. Yeah. It, I know a lot. I know a lot of guys. I know some Hall of Famers who don't believe that, though. But I, I am one who, it, with some of the other guys that are in the Hall of Fame, Pete Rose should be in the Hall of Fame. Exactly. And Period. It should matter. The Hall of Fame should be what you did on the field, right? Not what you did off the field. Well, and first of all, all his, all the allegations, gambling allegations, yeah, toward Pete Rose were when he was a manager, right. Regardless, of, and we don't know what he did as a player, but all right. the, all the stuff that came out was when he was a manager. So now I got I got to ask you, but now obviously with he what happened with P Rose. What about guys like uh, the steroid era guys? Do you see them ever getting in? You know, there's some that I don't, but I I, I think somewhere down the road, uh, Bonds and and Clemens uh, will get in. You know, down the road, I think. Because they, they were great players uh, even before there were steroid accusations. Yeah. Even like Clemens. Clemens had a great career uh, before. Bonds was a great one, one, two or three MVPs when he was with Pittsburgh. So uh, it, it certainly hurts them. Uh, and I wouldn't complain if they got voted in, uh, those two guys especially. But uh, I think down the road they will. I think and here's, another, here's another one too. I don't get just because of his political views, he's not in it. Uh, Kurt Schilling. Yeah, but he said he doesn't want to be on the the ballot next year. So <laughs> that's because because he knows he's not going to get voted in because yeah of yeah the politics. like yeah I think it's it's gotten to that where you know the these the writers now it's interesting because they do use a lot of the analytics now that yeah. they didn't before. Right. But they still have they still have that personal touch where I never I never there are guys who won't vote vote for Bonds just because they never liked him I don't like him either but I I think he should be in the Hall of Fame because of what he uh, did on the field Clemens I I I I'll tell you why I I enjoy Roger Clemens and like him when mm -hmm. my my youngest son was playing at Florida Atlantic University FAU mm -hmm. one of the kids on the team. His best friend was friends with uh, Roger from Texas. And the, the kids had a, a fundraiser one night. It was during spring training when Roger was with Houston. And he came down from uh, Kissimmee, where they were then, and spoke at a banquet. And did, did a nice job. And I kept I introduced him at the time. I was the MC, And I kept saying, Roger, you need to get back to uh, you know spring training. He goes, no, no, I got time. I got time. So he now should be in. Now you now you see a lot of uh, former players, kids in the league now, like the Bichette, the uh, Guerreros, the Co Nines, the Clemens, the Tatis, the uh, the Shields. Do you do you think that's the next involvement of players to come up? Is uh, former players' sons coming up? I think it just runs in, in, in waves. I think you have periods where there's, you know, former players have some kids who have uh, got the talent. I think if they have the talent, I, I would always take a chance on one of those kids, though, because they know what it's about. They've been around it. Uh, I was around uh, Bob Boone's kids, uh, mm -hmm. Brett, who had a really good career, and Aaron. And Aaron, who, yeah. I, I still I have a picture somewhere in my office of, of me in a Phillies uniform sitting on the steps of the dugout with two of uh, Steve Carlton's kids 
and Brett Boone and Aaron Boone. Little Aaron Boone was about three years old, had a helmet on. And so, so I mean, they were around the ballpark every day. So you, you knew if they had the talent, they still need to have that, that they would, they would be able to make it. Yeah. Uh, I, it's, it's just amazing to see because I think Tatis Jr. is – will definitely be way better than his daddy is. Oh dad, yeah. Yeah. His dad's claim to fame is the two grand slams in an inning. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. will always be his claim to fame. <laughs> yeah. His, <laughs> his son's a better player. His son's a big kid. Fernando senior yeah. was not as big. Oh yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And then of course you got Guerrero's kid who's already pretty much surpassed his dad in rookie stats. Yeah. I see him having, a nasty career, especially especially what he's done already. Yeah, I mean, yeah, some do and some don't. I mean, uh, uh, Bob Boone was a good player. Brett had the home run power, was a different type player. Aaron had a good career, uh, so they were all very similar. Their dad, Ray Boone, I never saw him play, but he he was a solid player. So you just saw the Griffies. Yeah, the Griffies senior I played against a lot. Different type player than yeah. junior. Wasn't the power hitter. Yeah. Uh, had the speed and hit a lot of line drives. I know, and they say uh, Griffey Junior was was uh, one of the all time greats. I, I I don't I can't say that because even though I, he was in my era, I can't really say that because it don't to me. It just varies by era who's great. You know, it just. Oh yeah, yeah. It's hard, very hard to compare eras. It is. It is. Like I gotta figure. Era. I gotta figure if Babe Ruth was the best player in his era, he he would have been pretty good in this era. You exactly. Know? So that's exactly. that's that's how and you look like at it. Your, just like in your era too. Like who would you have in your era? I mean, you had a list of lists of whose names. Yeah, I, I mean, I played with Mike Schmidt, who was yeah, a exactly. great George, and then George Brett. I didn't play against a lot. He was in the American League, but he, George Brett was great. So Joe yeah. Morgan, Johnny, Joe Bench. Morgan, all those guys. Yeah, and then you got like my generation. You got like I said, Griffey, um, the Boone, the Boone's brothers. I mean, it just it just depends. On, uh, but yeah, they've had. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, they've had a good they've had a good story career, and I just it's like I think these guys will eventually be Hall of Famers down the line. It just just depends on just how never know. You just never Byron, know. Byron, I'm I'm gonna get in the call that I got to get going here pretty soon. So yeah, I know it's getting late over here. Same call for you. Yeah, it's getting late over here too. <laughs> hey, I'm older than you. It's getting closer to my bedtime. <laughs> I, I, okay, I sort of figured I wasn't going to go that far, but <laughs> hey, I'll go that far. That's all right. <laughs> but it was fun. Um, I'll. Uh, do you want a copy of the episode? No, no, okay. that's fine. I, you know, I've I've heard these I've heard these stories that I've told before. <laughs> okay. <All right. laughs> well, it was fun. Um, thank you for your time. It was fun. Uh, I'll stay in touch with you. Okay. Please do, especially during the season. I, I certainly will. I, and there, there may be some news as to Marlins broadcasts. You never know. You never know. It might be. <laughs> I, I'll stay in touch with you. You, you. you will definitely hear from me. It was All right. You, you have a good night. Get some good Thanks, rest. Thanks, Byron. I will. <laughs> and enjoy All the right. season. I will. <laughs> Take care. Good to talk All to right. you. Good to talk All to right. you, too. All right. Bye.